Welcome to Brandon Hall Group's Excellence at Work podcast. You will hear from industry leaders covering innovative, cutting edge business, learning, and HR topics that weave current market research and technology into each episode. Our Excellence at Work podcast is hosted by Brandon Hall Group's Chief Operating Officer and Principal HCM Analyst, Rachel Cook. Thank you for tuning in to Brandon Hallgrave's Excellence at Work podcast. Don't forget to subscribe. Today, we're going to be talking about the future of learning and is your L&D organization ready for it? I am excited to have with me today, Dr. Vikas Joshi, the CEO of Harbinger Group. Hello and welcome. Hi. It's great to have you, and I would like to share with our audience a little bit about your background and organization. Dr. Vikas Joshi is a business leader who is passionate about product development and technology entrepreneurship. His mission is to help create software products that make a difference. A A key part of that mission is to inspire tech professionals and entrepreneurs to grow and develop. Harbinger, for those of you that are familiar, um, provides cutting edge e-learning solutions, which include Flash to HTML5 transformation, gamification framework, micro learning, interactive video, and competency-based learning. They work with strategic partners around the world to develop innovative, high-performing learning solutions. Um, They have also won seven Brandon Hall Group Excellence Awards in 2021. Congratulations. We have also, Brandon Hall Group and Harbinger have collaborated on an e-learning book um, in 2021, uh, Why Modernize Learning Content, Things You Need to Know, um, which can be accessed through our membership center and also we'll provide a link in our blog. Um, Lots of interesting insights there. And so I would love to now um, get started. Um, You know, I'd I'd love to hear from you, um, Dr. Joshi, about um, you know, your perspective on L&D um, as it's practiced in enterprises, uh, it, it sometimes can lag behind as technology and people expectations um, are, are moving ahead. And are we in one of those times, you know, from what you're seeing? Absolutely. Uh, and without a doubt, there are two sort of major shifts that characterize today's work. One is the skill economy. Mm -hmm. And the second is the hybrid work. Uh, Powerful as each one of them is on its own, the two together make an explosive combination that has serious consequences for work. And let's, let's look at each one of them. First, the skill economy, right? As technology races ahead, skill gaps appear and they widen and they morph and people have to keep up. Back in the day, a teacher could get by without knowing much about technology, not so today. Same with developers, same with accountants, you know, any any number of knowledge work professions you mentioned, you would see that there's a race for reskilling. And obviously businesses are looking to L&D to solve for Mm -hmm skilling, right? So it kind of sounds like the 1970s where the company is the place where you learn and shape yourself. You know, we had kind of forgotten that for a couple of decades, but it's come back right around. The other major shift is the hybrid work. But first of all, you can be sure that you can no longer assume that everybody's going to be in the same place at the same time. And you can be almost certain that no matter what people are working on, they're doing something else at the same time, right? So Mm -hmm. a never ending quest for new skills and a distributed workforce that has just tasted this autonomy of working from home. That's the future of work. And the future of learning is deeply entwined with the future of work. You know, in the old days, the idea was you first learn, then you go work. Mm -hmm. But it's a myth to say learning precedes work. And maybe training precedes work, certification precedes work, onboarding precedes work, but learning continues with work. 
you know the the essence of learning is the tools and people you encounter when you are at work and you learn by asking other people by doing apprenticeship by trying out various things by reflecting on what just happened by turning around and asking someone by teaching others by supporting by being part of a group all those learning methods are experiencing a big reset together with this reset in work and that's what makes this so heady and so exciting at the same time for lnd absolutely and so if what i'm hearing from you is the important areas is around rescaling um mm -hmm. we've also seen our research a lot of around upskilling um, mm -hmm. And, and you know, uh, you know how to develop and how to engage, especially when you have people that are working remotely and they are multitasking. Um, you know, there's more and more research from our our firm and scientific and um, psychology research around neuroscience. You know, the ability that the brain has and to what capacity that they can learn and in what time frame. And so, more and more of this new uh, way of or modernizing learning and, and offering, you know, continuous learning is, mm -hmm. is you know, is what we're seeing. Yeah, totally, totally, totally. And, you know, just going back to your, you know, 2022 research, mm -hmm. uh, the number one priority for L&D is to address the need to link learning to skills and competencies. Right there, you can see that 74% of your respondents stated that to be their number one priority. So okay. what you're saying is is very true. And with that said, what challenges does this face uh, L&D leaders and, and for providers? Um, the challenges are different for different constituencies. And I can think of three constituencies that we need to look at. Mm -hmm. One is the L&D leaders. Obviously, the learning and development leader is the ultimate, you know, consumer of learning technology, but also the learning content providers and the learning technology providers, they all face different sets of challenges. Uh, to begin with, the LND leaders have this unique challenge of straddling between mm -hmm. what the business is asking for, that is to solve for skills immediately, and what the learners are asking for, which is something as frictionless as social media, something that's easy to consume, doesn't take much time, and looks easy to consume. Now, the frictionless consumption is okay for social media, but when it comes to learning, you need to, you need to do a little more, right? So the bar for expectations is going up, but the, the need, to impart knowledge isn't coming down. You still need to do what you need to do. And, and the third challenge, apart from you know, meeting the business mandate and meeting customer expectations, is doing this in a fast and agile way. Hmm. Because the very definition of the project keeps changing depending upon the way technology changes. So gone are the days when you could lay out a whole project plan that is doesn't change for two years, you know? Things keep changing. So this whole adaptability and agility has become important for learning and development leaders. So I I, <clears throat> I see this as a as a invitation to reinvent L and D from the perspective of how they can now make the most of the seat at the table. Um, at the same time, the learning content providers have a whole new set of challenges. How to keep the content current, how to keep it accessible, and how to keep it consistent. Now, content has to be current because, you know, four out of five digital publishers we talk to, the first thing that comes up is the aging of content, you know. Mm -hmm. our, our content looks you know, jaded, it looks old, it looks obsolete, we need to do something about it. And and four out of five say that the fifth one is going to come around and say the same <laughs> sooner or later, right? And the, the, the issue is deeper than simply making it look 
new. There's many things that go into it, and I'm going to give an example of how, how we could do that. The other issue with content providers is their need to make learning accessible. At one point of time, accessibility had to do with complying with accessibility standards. But mm -hmm. now it's a diversity and inclusion issue, mm. you know, because disabilities tend to be of different kinds and you want to include all learners in your learning content. So how does a content producer factor that in, whether the accessibility standards mandate or not? And finally, consistency, because the content is going to be delivered in contexts that you cannot imagine. You know, it could be going out through a learning experience platform, a learning management system, or simply delivered in the flow of work. So the ability to keep it consistent and from a single source derive your micro learning objects or PDFs or what you have, uh, that's becoming important. So that's, that's the learning content provider set of challenges. When it comes to the learning technology providers, which is our final constituency, they have to leverage hybrid work patterns. And what do I mean by that? Firstly, if you go back to where we started, a big part of learning is the social environment and tools of a workplace. Mm -hmm. When all of that has become hybrid, how do you personalize content? How do you deliver some of those experiences that cater to that individual's needs? Mm -hmm. In a classroom, you had minimal scope to do that. But in an individual learner setting, someone might want to watch a video. Someone may want to skim through it as fast as they can, or preferably just get a summary of it. So the technology providers need to provide multiple options to learners. Mm -hmm. And then they need to integrate with systems of record because whether it is continuous performance management or employee engagement, all these systems will critically be entwined with learning experiences. And so you need to be able to have this interoperability. And finally, embedding learning into places where people live and people live in teams, in Slack, in Salesforce, those are the places where employees live and learning must occur there. So there's a lot of systems integration work uh, that, that falls out of this. So those are some of the things tech providers are grappling with. So long answer, but I see these three constituencies differently experiencing the reset. Sure, and there's a lot to think about and there's a lot to address um, mm -hmm. at, at you're looking at as you're looking at your content and um, some of the conversations I've been having and looking at our research is that um, not all of your content, you, that you don't have to start over with all of your content. You can leverage, you know, mm -hmm. past content depending on how relevant it is. Um, yeah. However, the modification of it or the modernizing of it um, through the technology, through the images, through the delivery, those are things that need to be addressed and um, that will take some effort. Um, I have two questions for you. One is around going back to your point around accessibility. What mm -hmm. are your thoughts as far as the delivery of content? Does everything have to be the same to address and to be inclusive to all different types of, of um, needs or uh, diversity needs and, and um, challenges, or do you customize it based on your audience? Well, the, 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 the answer has to do with personalization. If it is a choice that the learner has mm -hmm. uh, about the way they experience a video, for example, or the mm -hmm. speed at which they experience content, mm -hmm. that would be far superior than have a all-inclusive accessible you know content delivery so providing those options to make sure you do not exclude anybody is a good idea but for a given individual they will only see their preferred method of experiencing content and that makes sense because you want the experience based on how you 
based on the best way that you want to receive that information. Mm -hmm. There's some confusion there about what and how content should be designed and, and delivered where, mm -hmm. um, you know, but having that personal aspect of it or the personalization where they can um, receive it in a manner that makes sense to them to kind of remove some of the, the you know, the unnecessary um, noise or information or graphics that may mm -hmm. actually hinder the experience then be, then make it beneficial to them. Uh, and so what also around um, solution frameworks, what are solution, what solution frameworks are available to address these challenges beyond the personalization and what opportunities lie ahead that you see? That's, uh, that's really the good news. There's uh, problems that technology creates and there's <laughs> solutions that technology creates. So. More uh, like disruptions. <laughs> So now we have, you know, one one whole bucket of, uh, you know, frame tools is it focuses on learner engagement because, you know, the new reset basically causes the learner isolation, right? Everybody goes home. So how do you engage them? And these tools include uh, things like interactivity builders that let you add interactions to learning. Uh, they include nudge learning platforms uh, that that specifically deliver targeted learning experiences at the right time in the right place. Uh, video skimming tools that let you experience a video without having to go through it. You simply skim through it over the timeline and just see keywords to even know whether it's interesting question generators that let you take a piece of content and generate questions out of it. These are just examples of engagement tools. One particularly interesting example is with a Harbinger customer that I'm about to tell you about. And this is a hot dog chain, perhaps the world's largest with over 350 outlets across the US alone. You probably know who they are. Their problem, the usual challenge of fast food, quick service outlet providers, right? Mm -hmm. Frontline workers are mostly temps. They are in and out. There's a huge churn. They need to learn fast. And then building the necessary skills quickly is at a premium. And the mm -hmm. skill in question here is how to quickly look up a recipe for a hot dog. And now there are about 200 of those, you know, all PDF files that list these recipes. And the frontline worker is most likely going to simply use the service desk to ask the question. Here's what the order looks like. What recipe do I use? And the support desk can stay pretty busy. If you consider there are 350 franchises, you know, calling in as the drive through lines gets busy. What Harbinger did was we proposed a chat bot for frontline workers to learn recipes on the job. Using artificial intelligence and natural language processing, what Harbinger did was we built this bot that could take a user query, infer the intent, read the PDF files, and recommend the right recipe within a fraction of a second. Over time, the bot incorporated user feedback and got better at finding recipes. What I love about this story is that it's a great example of you learning on the job at the point of performance, right when you need it, because that's when you're going to learn it the most. And the use of AI to, to make, it, make it possible was particularly exciting for us. So this was the sort of first bucket of learner engagement <clears throat> solution frameworks. Right. That you know, that, that really is helpful, kind of thinking through some of the challenges and how to address them and, you know, developing that, that framework to guide you. That's critical, I think, for right. leaders. And, and like you said, you don't have to start from the beginning every time. So obviously right. you, need, you need frameworks for content migration, content transformation, and, mm -hmm. you know, doing accessibility at high scale. So mm -hmm. you can take what you have and rapidly transform it to new formats. How do you do that? Mm -hmm. uh, 
And sometimes it's not just a technical project, you know, hey, we got this legacy stuff and we need to modernize it. It can actually be a blessing in disguise. Now, we recently worked with a digital publisher that serves the oil and gas industry in the US. And they've been around for 50 years and they have a long list of offerings. They have instructional programs, e-learning, knowledge solutions, competency management, virtual learning, the whole nine yards. They faced a challenge that's not too different from many other digital publishers. Mm -hmm. They had a large library of courses that was developed a while ago for operators and technicians. Unfortunately, it included flash technology and were that they were outdated as a result. And they were also outdated in terms of design as well. So the goal was to redesign, but not only removing the flash dependency, but mm -hmm. also to support the new age learners. Mm -hmm. So the question was the operators and technicians of today, how are they different from those for whom those earlier courses were designed? You know, what, what has changed and wow. what will happen now? So instead of simply redeveloping the library, what Harbinger did was we developed a solution that was future ready. Okay. We supported accessibility compliance, compliance right out of the gate, micro learning nuggets that could be combined in different ways within mm -hmm. customer contexts, a new graphic design style, responsive and mobile friendly layouts, and easy to update content. So all those things together made up a whole new way of delivering this content. And the last bit was the ease of updating content. And this was so important because these regulations keep changing every now and then. And mm -hmm. you do not want to change everything. You just want to change the pieces that you must exactly. and they should propagate through the courses. So we use the Xylem learning content management system to yeah. accomplish the migration. And uh, this turned out to be a major reduction in operating costs at the same time, raising the learning engagement and driving business growth. So once again, what started out as a annoyance turned out to be a blessing in disguise and produced a much better library. That's great. And how, how long did something like that take you and your client? Yeah, so this, this was a pretty sizable project with 300 and uh, over 300 courses. And mm -hmm. so it, it took us several months to get okay. through this. You know? That's pretty impressive uh, time frame, though. Yeah, what makes it possible is the use of technology. If you were to hand wire each one of these, mm -hmm. that, would, that would be impossible. So you need yeah. to have technology to extract content objects, mm -hmm. you know, drop the ones that do not work anymore, and then do the replacements. So a yeah. lot of this is developed over years of practice at Harbinger. Right. And Vikas, and I think also the, one of the pieces too that um, I know that you're, um, I know that you find crucial too is making sure that change management piece and mm -hmm. the, um, also the, the client organization that they have, you know, they have someone that's vested in communicating with your team. Because um, oftentimes where we see a disconnect or, or things that extend is that lack of, of communication or staying on point on, on projects. And, and sometimes, you know, it, the, the providers may get blamed for it, but it's oftentimes the corporation, the client organization, where they have so many other priorities that they haven't really allocated the right time and invest or right time allocation towards. They may have the investment, but they don't have that time allocation where they are going to um, commit, you know, to giving you feedback, to providing you with materials, to, um, you know, making sure that their strategy is clear to you. So those yes. pieces are really important. Indeed, it's a team sport, you know. Uh, I, I recall a case where, uh, you know, these business schools that advertise their accreditations, um, and those accreditations usually come from bodies like the Association to Advance College Schools of Business. Mm -hmm. That's quite a mouthful, AACSB, right? And mm -hmm. they are a client. Mm -hmm. And they're a global nonprofit with <clears throat> over 900 colleges, 4 million students. You know, it's a big, big operation. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is that they rely on these member volunteers to essentially 
carry out the accredit accreditation processes. Mm -hmm. And with a growing scale and changing you know, guidelines, they needed to develop competencies in these volunteers. Okay. And those had to be in tune with the new accreditation standards. Mm -hmm. So the learning goals were very clear. The learning goals were know what is the accreditation philosophy, the new philosophy, know why your role matters, matters and know how to communicate the decisions to the college. Okay. But what we did, and this is where their participation really helped, is we went one level underneath those goals and say, said, what competencies underlie these goals? You know, what are the competencies they must develop so that they can perform on these goals? And we identified analysis, interpretation, judgment, and consensus building as the four critical competencies that needed to be supported. So a learning strategy followed, long story short, over 90% participants attained each of those learning goals. So okay. when you take the stakeholders into confidence and when, you, when you're willing to go deep with the, them to design your learning program, you, you get their participation. And this is, this is a nonprofit. That's a really good example. And before we wrap up today, uh, Vikas, is there anything else that you, any other examples or any other recommendations that you would like to share? Um, absolutely. I, I shared with you already examples of a fast food chain, a nonprofit, a publisher serving oil and gas. Mm -hmm. Great example. Um, we, are, we are working with a skill learning platform. Uh, again, arguably the industry's largest. And one of the things they have, they pride on is to create curated learning pathways for upskilling. What that means is you would have a variety of learning events that would lead you to your outcomes, but the, each event could be coming from a different LMS or a different content source. So you can imagine the amount of work involved in interoperability and integration. Uh, we help them with that. Um, these are only a handful of the thousands of projects we have accomplished over the past three decades, you know, uh, even from times when e-learning was called computer-based training. So when I connect the dots, I see a clear theme emerging. Mm -hmm. Work is changing and so is learning. And so Harbinger customers are increasingly looking for newer ways to engage learners, link their learning to work competencies, Mm -hmm. automate content creation and transformation and make the content delivery seamless through integration. Those are the, those are the themes that jump out. Um, at Harbinger, we span the spectrum from learning strategy, instructional design, development, deployment, integration mm -hmm. with platforms, the whole works. It's been an exciting time for the industry and uh, we certainly feel proud to be part of it. Well, I'm certainly proud to to be able to have you here with me today and for you to be able to share some of your perspectives and great customer examples. Um, again, congratulations for winning seven Brandon Hall Group Excellence Awards uh, in 2021. So we're excited to see what 2022 brings as I'm sure a lot more great examples and excellence work that you have underway. Um, it's been great to have you today. Thank you so much for, for joining me. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. I hope everyone listening in also uh, enjoyed and found a lot of value out of our discussion today. Uh, we look forward to chatting with you next time.